praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How great is our God. Came upon Moses and shone on his, from his face. Now indwells us. That same light that shone from the face of Moses now indwells us. That the world will see and fear and turn to him. How great is our God. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that you have left us your word. We, we lift it to you now, Heavenly Father, as in, from imperfect, imperfected, uh, yet imperfected vessels, Lord, and we ask you to speak through it to our hearts and our minds for the sake of and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It was good uh, for those that were with us on Thursday evening to, uh, to really have a, a good open and, and deep discussion about uh, the things that we've been speaking of, especially uh, the subjects that we covered last week. Uh, and it's good that we can discuss them, isn't it, as a family together, in peace and in the knowledge that God's Holy Spirit is working in each and every one of us. None of us have the whole answer. Only he has the answer. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read through chapter 8 and then we're going to look at some points as we go through. This is the, the fourth part of our series, looking through both letters of uh, of Paul to the church at Corinth and this being 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1 now as touching things offered to idols we, we know that all have knowledge knowledge puffs up but charity or love edifieth if any man think that he knoweth anything he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know but if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And there is none other God but one. Amen. We've been declaring that in our praises. There is no other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit, there is not every man, it, not in every man, sorry, that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idle temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And though thy knowledge shall be, shall the weak brother perish, and through, sorry, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh, while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Amen. A much shorter uh, chapter there, obviously, Paul didn't write his letter in chapters. Men added those chapters and verses much, much later. It just makes things a lot easier for us preachers to divide things up. But chapter 8, what is chapter 8 about? Well, it's, yeah, it's about food 
offered to idols and obviously there had been questions asked of Paul in this letter to, that was sent from the church at Corinth that Paul is addressing. Uh, for those of you who have heard the previous messages, especially the one, uh, the first one where we looked at the background of Corinth and the makeup of the social and religious and ethnic background of, of Corinth, you'll understand that it was very pagan in nature. The pagan temples there, pagan uh, temple of Aphrodite, and, uh, and much of that baggage came into the church at Corinth as people came to the Lord. And these are some of the things that Paul is addressing. But really, what it comes down to, if we think about it, are matters of conscience. Aren't they? Matters of conscience. But we're going to look through these 13 verses and, and see what Paul is, is getting at. And how it affects us today. Food sacrificed to idols. The word there, um, actually, it's, it's translated as, as a phrase. Things offered unto idols, or sacrificed, I think it says in, in some versions. Things sacrificed or offered unto idols. That word is idolothoton, idolothoton. It's a long Greek word and basically it means meat, animal, flesh. Offered to an idol or sacrificed to an idol. Okay, so we know what we're talking about. We're not talking about foods in general, like carrots or cabbage or anything like that. We're talking about meat offered or sacrificed to an idol. And that should strike home to all of us today. Because much of the meat that we buy, much of the meat that we eat, has been offered to idols. Halal meat is offered by Muslims to Allah. Prayers are said over it. So what do we do about that? Well, it's much the same kind of situation that they were in at Corinth, isn't it? And we'll look more about that as we go through. But what is Paul addressing? Well, it was an accepted practice um, in Corinth at the time and around that time in many, many cities, many uh, parts of the Roman Empire, this accepted social practice to have meals, social meals in a temple, social gatherings, or in a, in a building or a home that was allied or uh, linked with a particular idol. A home may have had its own little idols, uh, clay ones or metal ones or whatever in the home. You read about them all through the Old Testament. But it was, it was a socially accepted practice. And this was primarily the type of occasion when people would come together socially for meals like this. And to not attend that kind of function to refuse it or turn down an invitation would be to cut yourself off, as it were, from almost all social interaction. So it was a big decision to make, wasn't it? And that was because meat as such, as it is today, would have been pretty expensive. And fairly although there was probably plenty of it, it would have been expensive to buy. Plus, it would sometimes be the only meat that poorer people could get hold of by attending these communal, these social gatherings, these social meals. The second point here is that much or most of the meat that was available to buy in shops or whatever form they were, whether they be uh, slaughtered on the premises or meat bought from a slaughter house and, and sold in a, a different place, much of that meat had been ritually offered to idols already. Part would be offered to the God himself, 
or herself. Part would be given to the priests and part would be given to the congregation or the attendees of the meal. And so it would be, could be very difficult to tell if and what meat had been offered to idols in the shops or where it was being purchased from. Because you can't tell just from looking at the meat unless it's stamped with something. How do you know? And so these, these questions arose in the, in the church. There was fear and anxiety about this. Because you had Jews there who'd been taught that to associate with any idol other than the Lord was bad. And so, you, and you had the Gentile believers coming in who had bought this stuff with them and, and now they were, uh, reading and, uh, about the Lord and, 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 and uh, the teaching of Paul and all these things would bring confusion at times. What do we do? What do we do about this thing? Isn't, have any of you gone through the same thing? What do we do about halal meat? Where do we stand? Well, it leaves us two questions, doesn't it? it number one is, do we take part in idol feasts? Do we take part in... <laughs> We don't go to temples now socially, in that sense, and eat food, unless you go to an Asian uh, party or something like that. But we, we don't socialise in that kind of way now, do we? But we can be invited to someone's house who's bought halal meat. What do we do then? They may, they may be Muslim and invite us for a meal. What do you do then? Do you turn them down and offend them? Or what? So that's the first question. Do you take part in these things? And what do you do about meat purchased from shops? Because not all of it is labelled today, is it? Whether you go to one supermarket, I'm not going to mention any because it's going on the internet, one supermarket or another supermarket, you don't know quite often whether you're buying Meat that's halal, offered to an idol or otherwise. So what do we do? Well, Paul Paul starts this chapter, chapter 8, or this part of his letter, by dealing with the knowledge of idols. And he says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we have knowledge. We know about them, don't we? We know about there are idols, there are false gods worshipped today. We know them, we know about them. And we have our own understanding of these things. But Paul says, knowledge puffs up. Knowledge can be a source of pride. And it can cause us to offend our brethren. By utilising that knowledge over and above our love for them. And so in the first six verses, Paul talks about that. If any man love God, the same is known of him. And it's, it's really something, something really unusual. A phrasing is, is so unusual in one of these verses, but I want to come to that in a moment. We all have knowledge of idols and, and the scriptural stance about them. But knowledge, as I said on Thursday, for those of you who were there, knowledge, all knowledge and any knowledge on this earth can only and will only, until the Lord returns, be incomplete. The knowledge that we hold as fallible human beings will only be incomplete and partial. Only God has total knowledge. Only He knows the whole truth about everything. And so that's why we, we play with fire sometimes when we depend on our knowledge over someone else's. The knowledge we do hold, even though it might be true, and can and often does, it leads to pride, as I've said. It can lead us to act in pride over someone else. This is why Paul emphasises love in this chapter. Paul 
He's given much wisdom and understanding about these things by the Lord. And, and I praise God for that. And I praise God that God rose, raised up a man with intelligence, yes, but with divine understanding, inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us a record of what God really intends for us. That's why Paul emphasises love. And this, as with many other matters, shouldn't be about what we know, but about how we use what we know. Matters of conscience. It's not just about what we know, or we think we know, it's about how we use and walk in that knowledge. Love has permanent effects, and we'll see that in a minute. And this, I want to bring up now verses 2 and 3. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. What's he saying there? If you think you know the truth, you don't know it all yet, because you haven't been perfected. You will, one day, know as you are known. But not yet. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Now, it, when I read that, it suddenly struck me the way that Paul puts that. He says, if any man thinks he knows anything, he knows not as he ought to know. Then he says, but if any man loves God, you would think he was going to say, he has good knowledge. Wouldn't you? It sort of follows on logically, doesn't it? If you think you know something, you don't know, as you should. But if you love God, I would have thought he'd have said, then you'll have real knowledge. But he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, but if any man love God, the same is known of him. So what does that mean to us? Well, it means that it's not so important that we know God. Obviously, it is important that we know God. But it's not as important as being known by God. And in that respect, he's talking about our relationship with him, isn't he? The depth of our relationship. It's better to be known of God and allow God to, to move through us than to stand with pride and say, I know God. It's important that God knows us. Let's look quickly at 2 Timothy chapter 2. A couple of scriptures here I want to, to look at. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And that departing from iniquity includes walking in pride. Turn with me again to Galatians chapter 4 verse 9. Galatians chapter 4. And verse 9. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? But now after that you have, been, you have known God, or rather are known of God, why do you turn again to weak and beggarly elements, to the, you, those things that you used to be in bondage to. You know, in these two verses in, in chapter 8, verse 2 and 3, I see a gentle rebuke by Paul of those who had maybe been walking in pride, those who were maybe more knowledgeable, uh, older in the faith, and kind of in a way lording it over those with a weaker conscience. 
We can eat these things. You know, we, we have knowledge. Rather than acting in love to the brethren. But back to the letter. Verses 4 to 6. We as believers know, or we should know, that there is only one God. Amen? One God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Three parts. One one God. One living and true, precious God. Mighty in power, awesome in deeds, but merciful and gracious to those that love him. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Does that mean in some things? Or in all things? There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There is only one God and so all other gods are non-existent. They're nothing. In fact, turn with me to Deuteronomy 32 and God makes it quite plain what he thinks about them. Deuteronomy 32 verse 17. Are you there? Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. And you know what the Lord is saying there? All other gods are demons. All other gods but him are demons whether they be wood, stone, metal, whatever. A picture in a frame in a church, they're all backed by demons. They're no gods at all. They're created beings. Demons are created beings, fallen created beings. They're not gods. And they can do nothing. They have no power. Only to deceive Amen. So then, there are no gods at all. They are all false. They were not involved in creation and they have no power. I want us to read Psalm 115. Just two verses from Psalm 115. I love Psalms. So much wisdom and so much truth from the pen of David and others. Psalm 115, verses, well, a few verses, 4 to 9. I'll start at verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. Amen? Can you say amen to that? Our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Their God, their idols, are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes, but they see not. Ears, but they hear not. Noses, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Is that plain? That's what God thinks of idols. They're nothing. There is, was and ever will be only one God. And he is Yahweh. Verses 7 to 13 now, 7 to the end. So we've, we've seen that idols are nothing. Idols don't really exist. They're not gods. They're phonies. Fabrications without power. But in verse 7, Paul says, How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. We know that because the majority of us are mature in the Lord. We have understanding. God has spoken to us clearly of these things as we read his word, as we read the whole counsel of his word about what he says about these things. But not all have that understanding. Some are new in the faith. Some may not have come to the faith yet. 
But that word how be, it means however. However, Paul has been teaching that as believers, we should view false idols as nothing at all. They're meaningless. It doesn't matter if we eat food sacrificed to idols. If we give thanks to God who provided it in the first place, it's sanctified, isn't it? It's his creation given to us. That's our knowledge. That's our understanding. As we read scripture. But not all have that understanding yet. Not all are in that place. Not all might have confidence in that stance. Now he makes the point that we that we don't live in a perfect world yet. There are those amongst us who will be weaker in faith. There will be those that have problems, maybe of where they've come from in the world. Maybe got saved out of the Muslim religion or, or another religion that, uh, that offers food unto idols. That may not have that understanding. All believers don't and won't see it that way. Not until the Lord returns and, and we're perfected and we are as he is. And here I would like us to read Matthew 15, verse 10 and 11. Matthew 15, verse 10 and 11. Somebody's in good voice. (laughs) And he, this is Jesus speaking now, called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand. Now then, do you think Jesus wants to say something important? Okay. Verse 11. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the man defileth. So, what do we gather from that? I know it's it's in a different context to what we're talking about. He's talking about... uh, unclean things and eating on the the Sabbath and not washing hands and one thing or another. But the principle is the same. Jesus says it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the believer. It's believers he's talking to about. It's what comes out of the mouth. Isn't it? And it's of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. Not from what we eat. Physically. It's more like what we eat spiritually. What should fill this is this. Amen? The bread of life. And so when Paul says in in, in verse, what he says in, in, uh, in verse 8 there about about the, these gods being nothing and we, and we should see them as nothing, I believe he's referring back to that. These words that Jesus said and these principles that Jesus laid down. Again, it's our love that should govern our actions, not our knowledge. We've been talking about what we know and what we understand. Are all of us clear that idols are nothing? Okay, so we need hold no fear of going in to a mosque. We should have no fear about eating halal meat. Because those idols that are worshipped there are nothing. God knows they are nothing, and we should know they are nothing. We are to stand in the presence of Almighty God, with that light that shone from Moses' face, shining through us, to convict them that they are sinners. Amen? They should be afraid of us. What does Scripture say? They shall see and fear and turn to him. See what? 
His life in us. His vitality in us. The faith of Christ in us. To stand over and look down on the demons and the idols worshipped by those who don't know the true and living God. God has all power and all authority and he has given it through Jesus Christ to you and me. So how can we be afraid of eating halal meat? But not everyone will have that knowledge. Not everyone will have that understanding yet. And that's what Paul is getting at. It's not to say that we should leave our brother or sister in in that weakness. We should do whatever we can, whenever possible, and however possible, to lead them gently into a deeper knowledge of God. And a deeper knowledge and understanding of his truth for them as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that they are built up. And Paul takes a whole chapter in Romans 14, speaking about building up the brethren. Read it in your own time. He exhorts them to to encourage and build up the brethren. Building up each other. That's why it's good when we come together on a, a Thursday for a Bible study, we can talk about serious issues and not be afraid to touch them. Because God has given his answers on everything in this word. For us. That we don't need to stay weak. We don't need to stay in that weak condition. We can move towards that fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. The point here to get right down to it, really is our rights, isn't it? Everybody likes to act on their rights these days. Every group has their rights and they march up and down the street proclaiming them, ignoring everybody else's. But Paul is talking about our rights as believers here, our conscience and how we Use the knowledge that God has so graciously given us through his word. Our rights as believers, that's right. So what does Paul say in in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? We, We went there a couple of weeks ago. He says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful to me, but not all things, but all things are not expedient. Or in other words, they're not all profitable or for good. And this is where we have to use our conscience, our love for our brethren over what we know. Acting on our own rights to eat such meat before uh, weaker brethren, people who, as we've said already, may have come out of Islam or whatever it may be or or not be sure about these things is to impose our rights our understanding over our love for them this is what Paul is, is getting at here how do we view our brothers and sisters do we love them enough that we want to encourage them to grow or do we just want to impose our rights to do anything we want It's it's our love, isn't it, that should guide because it's the love of God shed abroad in our hearts that allowed us to be convicted of sin in the first place. It's love that brought Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. He didn't have to do that. But he did. Out of his love for us. And so... Our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ should sometimes take precedence over our knowledge and understanding on certain matters. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? 
Is everybody clear? Does everybody see what, what Paul is saying there? Because he lays it out quite clearly, doesn't he? We need to remember that if we, not to lord it over someone, that's not the right phrase, but if we enact our rights or our, if we act on our knowledge and understanding at that level before someone who is weak, it can cause them damage. That may take a long time. There may be counselling in the Lord and the Word to put right. So this is what Paul is saying. We need to remember that as well to, to sin against our brother, which that would be. That would be a sin against our brother to cause him to fall, to stumble at some point. But the sin against our brother is bad enough in itself, isn't it? But as Paul learned in Acts chapter 9, verse 4, where he met with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Emmaus, it's no less than sinning against Christ himself. Because he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, he didn't persecute Jesus personally, to my knowledge. He persecuted the brethren, didn't he? But Jesus looked upon that, an attack on his brothers and sisters, as an attack on himself. And this is how we should view these things in our lives. So then, the matter comes down to those questions. So do we eat or do we not eat? Do we buy or do we not buy? And some might see in these questions and, and the, the answers that Paul appears to give in, in chapter 8 here, some variance from what was stated in, in Acts 15. Do you remember? Let's, let's read that. Acts 15. Verse, um, verse 19 and 20. Wherefore my sentence is, this is James, my sentence is that we trouble them not, that's the Gentiles, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And Paul took that back, but what he says here in Corinthians, some might think, well, isn't that contradicting what was said there? But what we have to understand is that, that Paul had a broader understanding than maybe James and the others did. They came from a place in Judaism where it was a sin, it was abhorrent to God for to to meet with other idols, to associate with things given to idols. But Paul is given this divine revelation to bring to the Gentiles that these idols are nothing. Through Christ and what is done, the victory on the cross has given us that power and authority of God over and above anything that the devil can do or will do or is involved with. The grace and the mercy of God is given to us, isn't it? And Paul says, it lies out, as it says in Deuteronomy, that we're under a new covenant. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The victory has been won over these things and somebody's happy behind me <laughs> that's great but is that clear it's, it's not contradicting it but it's a it's a, a more enlightened understanding it's a more enlightened understanding because it's a fuller understanding of what God has done the old covenant is put away the new covenant has come in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should have no fear in these things. We should know that everything we eat 
we should give thanks for anyway. Because it's a gift of God, isn't it? Let's read one of the last scriptures. 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 7. I'll read from verse 4, actually. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with what? Thanksgiving. So everything is good. Amen? If received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. I think that's pretty plain, isn't it? Everything to be accepted with thanks giving. Everything is good if we give thanks for it. However, this knowledge and understanding shouldn't be shouldn't govern our actions. Our actions should be governed by our love and our consideration and our compassion for our fellow brothers and sisters. Amen. To do this, we need to know them and their spiritual condition, which means getting to know each other as a family, not holding up barriers or keeping things secret. We are a family in Christ Jesus, brothers and sisters, one heart, one mind, one faith. Doesn't mean to say we don't have a little bit of privacy. But we need to know each other so that we can encourage and build each other up in the faith. So then, if in doubt, don't eat. If in doubt, don't buy. But you're not condemned by God in any way if you do eat or if you do buy. Because everything is good if received with thanksgiving. Because it's sanctified by the word and prayer. So do you say grace before you eat? Let's hope you do. Because in doing that, you've sanctified what you're about to eat. Whether it's offered to idols or not. Amen? We're not then to allow ourselves to be puffed up by our knowledge, our understanding. But rather to honour our weaker brothers and sisters in the eyes of the one true living God. And surely that's better, isn't it? Amen. God bless you.